Okay, we are back. Hopefully. Yeah, we are back. Okay, sorry about that. Part two. Um, so we're almost finished up here. All we had left to do was copy that header from the Spark Fun. So we, we basically need the same header we had here. The difference being we only need one power connector. We're only going to do one connector for power. Probably most people using the Spark Fun board, they do the same thing. So we're going to do a four pin header here. We're going to go back to the same thing here. We're going to do one to find a four pin header. We're going to do one by four. Uh, and then we're going to go again back to pin headers, sort by availability. Okay. So that looks like what we want. That part number is here. Go to library. Okay, so for this one, we need a ground. And we need uh, data out and uh, the clock. And there's a library for using this particular strain gauge. It's a little weird. I actually found out after I bought these strain gauges that there's an equivalent version of the strain gauge that uses I squared C. That's probably what we should have used, probably what I should have used. Um, I didn't though, so. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's the only thing is like the way this communicates, the way it does data out and clock, it's, um, it basically to configure this thing, you have to play some funny games with the clock after you send the data. Uh, the good thing, you know, you send like extra clock pulses and that tells it what to do. The good thing is th that's a library that's already available for us. So we're not going to have to like redo that library. That type of stuff would be the things we'd make our seniors do if they were doing a senior project. We'd make them sort of do a library. It's a lot of work and it's a, a kind of a mess, but we're going to skip that. It's a nice thing. We get to skip it. Um, so we're going to put power ground and those two data connections to this header over here. And I think that's pretty much it. I think, are we good? Yeah, so we didn't play games with that. We just grounded rate. Do we ground rate? Yep. X in is grounded. D out. And then we're not using input B here. And we're not using input B. Yeah. Now, if you want to, for yours, you could make another header. You could wire that pin out here. You could add a ground to this. You might want to add, you might want to make a four pin header and add a ground to it. As long as you know what it is, that's all that really matters. As long as you know, as long as you have this basic connection and you know how the rest of the stuff is connected, um, it should be totally fine. So, um, and we'll have plenty of boards of each of these. So if somebody's board doesn't work, who knows, my board might not work, but we'll have enough people making boards. We'll have, everybody should get five or 10 copies of their board. So, um, so we will uh, we'll, we'll make it work no matter what. But it looks to me like this is pretty much done. So when we're done with the schematic, you know, of course we want to go over it, finding. Oh, uh, well, actually, if we don't, if we're not using inputs B here, let's copy this. So just cop, just Control C, Control V. That's the only real hot key I'm using throughout this video. Um, so we'll copy that just to let it know. And so now we're kind of done with the schematic. And the way the software works now is it says. The schematic tells it every component that it's using. For each one of those components, it should have a footprint that it knows it's using. We chose parts directly out of the library, so they automatically attach a footprint to a schematic symbol. If they didn't, there's an extra step where we'd have to create footprints or attach footprints to each of the components. In our case, we should be okay as is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna now take this schematic with, which defines how all the things have to be connected. It defines all the components, and we move over to the PCB side. That in that side, instead of dealing with these symbolic library parts, we'll be dealing with the actual footprints for the packages. And the problem is once you get to the footprints of the packages, they're really abstract, right? You'll see two little squares of metal. You don't know which square of metal is which. It's hard to tell you know, what connects to what. That's why we do all of our connections in the schematic. That's the whole point of EDA software is it lets us, this is very easy for our brains to understand. But once we get to the point where it's just chunks of metal and squares on a board, it's harder to, it's more abstract. We're more likely to make mistakes. So this using the schematic versus PCB side just helps avoid mistakes. So if we think everything is good, everything's fine. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is the annotation. So every time we created a part, it gets C7, C6, C4. 
This software, Easy EDA, does that automatically. That's not necessarily the case in other software. So other software, we'd have to go through what's called an annotation process. That's where each one of these symbols gets its own distinct name so that it can be referenced on the actual PCB. Uh, but again, what I like about this software is it says, hey, you're going to have one anyway, let's just do it. The only reason it would matter is if we cared, you know, if this one shouldn't have been C7, if this should have been C1 for whatever reason, if we were expecting it to be C1, that might be a reason we'd want to re-annotate. For now, let's just leave it as is. Let's save. And then what we'll do is we'll go design and we'll do convert schematic to PCB. And when we convert schematic to PCB, it should go through a process that does an error checking. Uh, if we want to, we can do... Uh, uh, there's like a, a way to do an error checker, but I can't see, I'm not sure I even did it when I did this before. Uh, um, let me see. So I don't see where that is. Let's do, yeah. So let's just do convert it to a PCB. Um, convert schematic to PCB. Now this should do an error check, yeah. So it didn't throw any errors. So if it didn't throw any errors, that means it's probably okay. So when we first go over to the PCB, you'll notice it just tossed all of our parts on there. So it just threw a bunch of junk out on the PCB because uh, it doesn't know how we want to assemble these parts. And the other thing it has sort of a, a you know, sort of a, it gives us board outline rectangle, how many copper layers, it should always be two, the units we're gonna use. We don't have to use millimeters, but I think that's fine. Um, so the start height and width, the rule is it has to be under 100 by 100, but there's no real rule other than that uh, for, for your design. If it's over 100 by 100, it starts to get expensive. If it's under, it's not too big of a deal. Uh, this, a 30 by 20, if we're using Osh Park, this would cost us about uh, $5. If we're using PCB Way, it's $4 no matter what, up to, or sorry, if we're using JLC PCB, it'll be up to... Uh, we can go up to 100 by 100 and it's still just four dollars let's give ourselves just just to start out we can always change this later let's make it a little bit bigger 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters okay so the little purple is our sort of default outside box um and then this is just all of our parts so i always just visually like to move all my parts inside here um so when it comes to layout, the first thing you want to consider is you want to consider where the parts that connect externally to the board need to go. So, so the main things we care about is these headers. So if you go back to the PCB way, or sorry, to SparkFun, and we can't, we don't need the schematic anymore. You see, they put these headers all the way off on one side of the board. They put these headers all the way off on the other side of the board. That's probably a nice technique to do. So, um, so let's just start by putting those headers over on one side. So this header, uh, and if we zoom in, we can see the VCC and ground over, oh, that goes on the other side. So H2 should go on this side. Let's rotate it so that VCC is up. And again, if we zoom in on the pin, we can see this pin's VCC, this pin's ground. So if we want it oriented the same way SparkFun was, SparkFun had VCC and ground like that, uh, we'll just do it uh, ordered like that. And then this H, so L1, R1, R2. So here's the thing, it doesn't, we didn't give names to these signals. So it's basically saying this pin is touching the inductor. So this pin is actually going to be that top thing and th these pins are touching R1 and R2. Um, so we want the inductor side up. Rotate it once, okay. Now you also might say, well this is confusing because there's a square pin and two circle pins. The square pin and two circle pins Normally the square pin is pin one. Uh, we'll have all these labels, so it doesn't really matter, but I might be tempted to go back in here and switch the order of this. Um, I, don't, I don't want to, it'll be fine as is. So we're just gonna kind of generally put this off on the left side, generally put this off on the right. Um, now you'll see when you grab a part, you see all those little white wires that show up there? Those are known as air wires. What those do is the software is based on the way we designed our schematic, based on all these connections we made, the software knows what things this has to be connected to. So the software knows what parts this chip has to be connected, which pins of this chip has to be connected to which part. So as we move this around, we can see how easy it's going to be to connect to these parts. Um, like we can see, see if we got wires crossing over, we might want to move this part 
right? So these wires don't cross over and rotate it, right? So now these wires don't cross. So air wires can be handy as a way of just saying, hey, are my wires crossed? Are they not crossed? Whatever. We're going to take this. We're going to do like what SparkFun did, where SparkFun pin one is up here. If you go back to the SparkFun, they orient pin one. You can see that little ball. It's up top. We're just going to do the same thing. So we're going to click this. We're going to hit R to rotate. Rotate it a couple times. Boom. Now our thing is in here. And for now, I'm just going to, I'm going to put everything kind of where I want it, and then I can tighten it up later if I want. These don't have to be that tight, though. The biggest mistake I've found students make is once they get to the PCB, they totally forget about the schematic. You know, they say, what's R3? I don't know what R3 is, but I know where it's connected. Look, I can see where it's connected, so they just start rotating. I've always found it's better to go to go back to the, to the schematic and say, okay, based on the schematic connection, let's be a little reasonable with our PCB connection. So if we have our PCB here, let's get this side taken care of. So uh, this side's pretty easy. The only thing that needs to be on this side is really that connector. We might want to put these capacitors over there too. We already have the connector over there. Um, so maybe these capacitors, we'll put those on that side too. So those capacitors for us were C4, C7, and C6. Uh, so let's go back to C4. This is a big one. This is the big one, C4. C7 and C6. Okay. So, and for now, and normally these are just, you know, VCC up, and that'll work well with the pins. So, in this case, the big capacitor again is for filtering at high frequencies, the little capacitor is for low frequencies. This should be fine like this. Now these names will show up on the circuit board. The C4, actually I think I missed, yeah. So the C4, C7, C6, they will show up. They are useful for assembling the circuit board. Uh, we don't need to worry about them right now. We can assemble all those later. Uh, but for now, let's just get the rest. So that was that one side. Oops, let's go back here. So the next thing we want, we probably want this transistor kind of close to the PCB. We have this divide, this divider, or the voltage divider that's sensing the voltage that should by design be kept close. So let's do R3 and R4. Let's get those close to the circuit. Oh, I keep doing that. Let's get R3 and R4. So R3 and R4, those were our two, yeah, those are the two resistors for the divider. So this one, let's rotate that. Okay, that's kind of nice that we have keep it somewhat close we don't want to get too close these look very big right now but in reality these are pretty big or these are pretty small parts so if you get them too close it can be very hard to assemble these so we're just going to leave these here for now q1 that's that transistor if we want we can go back and we can see what spark fund did so spark fund put the transistor like this that's fine we could do that too put the transistor kind of there-ish let's align the pads maybe Okay, that looks fine. That works nice because the output of this goes right into here. Let's do that inductor now while we're at it. So the inductor that comes off of that is here. This is a, that's a fine place for the inductor. Uh, and then after that inductor, we have those two big capacitors, remember? So we have the inductor and then we have C3 and C5. C3, which is the big boy. And then C5. And you notice the air wire will always move the part to the closest connector that it's next to. So yeah, we're getting a little crowded here, but it's fine. I'm, I'm going to leave a lot of space with this. I'm not doing a compact PCB design. I can show you the one I did later that is compact. I don't like this logo being here, so I'm just going to rotate this and move it. Just right now, move the logo on top of there. Move this here. Uh, okay, and then so uh, let's get the rest of these in here. So maybe I'll stop doing that. So we have C2 needs to be connected just between this pin and ground. We're not worried about the ground connection right now. So C2 uh, is just right at that pin. You can rotate it like that. It looks like we have the grounds here, so it's okay if this is upside down. That'll, that should be fine. People keep knocking on my door. One sec, let me pause. Yeah. Okay, so let's. So we got C2 in there, and also just, you know, I'll, I might as well just put these next to it. So I'm just going to, just just for cleanliness, just so I don't start losing my mind, 
I'll put these names here. You really just want to keep the name next to the component, but it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, and then we will, um, oops. Okay. So go back here. What else do we have? We have, okay, all this C1. So C1 has got to be next to these pins. So we'll go, oh God, I will never stop doing that. So C1, there's another software that I use. So that's the right order. So we can just set, we can always route this around. As long as we leave enough space, we can always route this around. So we'll just, it's fine like that. We can just leave it like that. And then, so coming off of C1, and I'll just be consistent and I'll rotate this around. Coming off of C1, we should have those two resistors. Oh boy. I did it again. So those are R1 and R2, and these are non-precision. These are just the resistors that allow the signal to be RC filtered. They also, having these resistors in series also prevents, you know, you'll it'll, it'll prevent if there's ever a too large of a voltage, it'll limit the current that can flow. If, the, if, you, if you end up kind of breaking it, it'll limit the current that can flow in there, but it shouldn't be an issue. Um, so we'll go back and we'll do R1 and R2. And I, I want to be a little compact with these. So, I mean, I don't want my board wandering down. I don't want it to be too big. And so we'll just name that R1. Uh, we'll put the R labels here. It actually needs to move a little over. Okay, that's fine. And then R5 and R6, those, those are our precision. Those are the bottom half of our bridge down here. So just to limit noise, we should probably not let those get too far away. I want to zoom in. So these are grounds. So we have grounds on the inside right now, which should be fine. I'm going to show you what we're going to do with grounds here in a little bit. Okay, that's fine. So at this point, uh, I might just do a little housekeeping. Call that R6. Well, we'll call it R5. We'll move this one over here. Okay, so yeah, this is not a compact board. Right now, I'm clearly not that worried about keeping this compact. There's some things we could do to, to I'll probably compact this a little bit. We got a lot of open space in here. Not a huge deal. You know what? Maybe just to make this a little tighter, what I might do is I might move these here. And then move this one down a little bit. So this should ultimately be fine. This is this is an okay compactness. Um, power and grounds I don't care about because I'm going to show you we're going to do a little trick with that. Everything else looks okay. Um, are we missing any parts? Nope, it looks like we got everything. So what we've done now is we've taken our main components and we've laid them out sort of where we like them. Sometimes it's good at this point. You know, a lot of times we still have to move these things around, but if we want to switch labels around, we can... This Q, because this Q is the highest thing on the board, so ultimately that Q would have limited how big we could make the board. So I'm going to move that the C6 we can do here. C7. Yeah, so maybe what I'll do is I'll... Now that this this part this is our main uh, chip. The U1 stands for you know the the U is the logo we use for any um, uh, uh, any uh, chip that is uh, um, I forget the term for it, but basically components that have multiple discrete you know multiple resistors capacitors. God, I can't remember the name. I'm losing my mind a little bit. Um, those are always labeled with a U, so they're uh, 
Um, so, so any digital chip would of course be a U. Any any complex thing that has multiple devices in it would be labeled with a U. God, I can't. It's discrete versus. Uh, this is embarrassing. Oh well, whatever. Um, okay, so that's pretty good. Let's. The header don't really need labels, but we can do labels. That's fine. All right, that's okay. Um, so now that we have this generally here, now we wire this thing up. So I mentioned ground I don't care about. I mean, we're going to wire all the signals except for ground. I like to start with the stuff that's right next to the pins. So what we're going to do is we have two layers. We have the bottom layer of copper and the top layer of copper. We should be able to pretty much wire this entirely within the top layer of copper. And the nice thing about that is it'll allow us to use the bottom layer of copper as our um, as our uh uh, ground layer, like the whole thing. So we can do track or we can hit the W key. And then when we select a pin, it'll show us with that air wire where it needs to go. So in this case, uh, pin U12 or U13 needs to go here. Okay, now I've connected that. I hit W or the track key again, U14 to go here. So now what we're doing is we're specifying where the physical copper connections are. Um, let's say we want this physical copper connection to be a little, so and that was just the sense resistor path, but let's say for this power supply we want this to be a little bit fatter. Uh, there's a couple things we can do. Uh, one thing we can do is we can specify as we're routing it, we can say we want the routing width to be uh, let's say um, 0.5 millimeters. Okay, so now if the routing width is 0.5 millimeters, now we have a fatter connection here. For this board, because it's all low power, none of that really matters, but we might as well do the power and ground with a fat connection here. So I'll just, I'm just going to do the power now that. Now, one of the things that throws students off is I ran this trace behind this C7. So all the copper is going to be underneath a, a solder mask, which is then going to have these silk screen. The, all the stuff in yellow is going to be silk screen on top of it. So you're not going to really see this copper trace underneath. That's all going to show up later. Um, for now, let's route the VCC, the power. We'll route that up to here. Uh, this one needs, we need to get power from this pin. Again, I don't, I don't worry about grounds yet. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Um, okay, so let's go back to, um, I think it was 0.254. Let's go back to routing the rest of these. Six. Seven. So, and you see, the software is going to prevent us from doing anything that's not allowed. So, when that when you build these PCBs, the fab can only get just like resolution on a printer. It can only get pieces of metal so close before it'll accidentally bridge them. And so this software for the fab that we're using automatically says, if you're not allowed to get that close, it won't let you. You see what it does there. So that's a nice thing about this. Other software, you have to spend a lot of time setting the rules. So with this software, as long as we're using this, the fab that is associated with this software, and the fab that's associated with this software, you know, pretty much it'll work for everything. But it, the process becomes, it's really easy, right? We don't have to worry about, a lot of these details are completely not things we have to worry about, which is nice. Okay. But you notice because we laid this out well, these routes are very easy. If you don't if you don't lay it out properly, um, these routes can be a real pain to do. So this thing is here. 
This is what allowed us to control the gate of our transistor. And we'll do these. So, so the nice thing about this design is we can get all the wire connections all on the same layer, which is very rare that that's the case. So if, if it weren't, we'd have to do some fancy routing. Okay, let's go back and finish up these power connections. And I think for those, we did 0.5 just for fun, so 0.5. Okay. So I think all that's left now is grounds. And so one fun thing about the grounds now, are, these, are we sure we don't want these connected? Yeah, 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 we don't want those connected, yeah. Yeah, so all this left is ground. So what we're gonna do for ground is a common technique called the ground plane. So what we're gonna do is we're going to um, switch to bottom layer. So we're gonna click this little blue button. So now we're operating on the bottom, so on the metal that's on the bottom layer of this thing. And we're gonna go place, and we're gonna do, I think it's solid region. Nope, place, copper area. And the net we're going to specify as ground. And then we're just going to draw around the entire shape. We're going to leave a little gap near the edge like that. And we're going to draw around the entire shape a box. And if you don't get it exact, it's fine. escape. So what that did is that just created a solid chunk of copper on the bottom of our PCB that's just for ground. So now anything that we connect to this bottom side of the PCB will be connected to a ground plane. Uh, and you'll notice what it did is it where we have this ground pin it connected the ground plane with these little spikes like this. Why did it connect these spikes? These spikes are known as thermal relief and what they do is if you had all of this copper directly connected to this pin, it would be very difficult to solder this pin because the copper is going to act as a heat sink. So the reason we do these little spokes like this, and these are kind of fat spokes, I might change it. Um, but the reason we do these fat spokes is so that uh, is so that you have electrical connection, a good electrical connection, but not a great thermal connection. And I, I'm going to tweak it a little bit. So I'm going to click this, and I'm going to go back to spoke. So if I specify the spoke width as point, uh, let's do point four millimeter. See, you see how these spokes just got smaller, right? So the nice thing about that's going to make it. It's going to give us a little bit better thermal relief. It should be totally fine. Okay, let's switch back to the top plane, the top layer. Okay, so now. This ground pin is connected to this big chunk of metal that's going all the way on the bottom of my circuit board. So anywhere where I need a ground, all I have to do is punch a hole through and I'll be touching ground. So the way we do that, just to be easy, and there's, uh, there's lots of different ways to do this, but if we click the via pin here, and anywhere we want to go down to ground, we click this, hit escape. This via pin, or via, is a connection between the top side of the board and the bottom side of the board. And actually, it'll connect to any layer. If we had more than a two-layer board, it'll, it'll connect to any layer. Um, and in this case, there's no net specified. So we'll specify a net of ground. So what that's telling the software is it's saying, OK, it's OK for this pin to be connected to a ground layer. And I'm just going to copy this, and I'm going to paste it. And hopefully, it keeps the ground. Yeah, I'm going to paste it anywhere where I need a ground connection. I'm going to paste a new one of these anywhere I need a ground connection. I need a ground connection here. Oops. Uh, we'll do it. Yeah, this should be fine here. I need a ground connection here. I need some ground connections here. And you might as well do multiples. It doesn't really hurt to have more connections to ground. It just lowers the resistance. I want to keep, if I ever put these through holes underneath a chip, I want to keep them away from these pins because 
what's happening under this chip is everything under this chip is when the physical chip is on top, you can't really see under it. So if you don't have these things far away from the pins, it's possible to get a little bridge, which in this case would be okay because it'd be ground to ground. But when it's between other things, sometimes that can be a bit of a problem. So we have another ground. So for instance, like if I did this connection here, if I put this via here, it would be possible for us to bridge solder between that U14 and that ground. And we might not know. We could have a bridge and we wouldn't know it. So, so we, I like to keep it, if I, if, I, if I work under a chip, I like to keep it kind of far away like that. And is that good? Uh, let's put one here. Yeah, let's put one here. Let's put one here. That looks pretty good to me. Okay, so now that I have those connections to ground, I hit escape and I go back to routing the wire. I'm on the top layer. So now, oops. Well, that's fine. We'll do fat connections to ground. That'll be fine. I'm still set to 0.5 millimeter, but whatever. Okay. Now, now what I want to do is I want to look over my board and I want to make sure I don't have any of those air wires. No air wires. Everything looks good. I think we're pretty close to being done here, actually. We're very close to having a finished design. Um, all of our, so all of our, our electrical connections are made. We have a good ground connection. Our power flows pretty well. It looks kind of similar to what was on the other board. Um, so now what I want to do, though, is I want to do check DRC. So this will check for any design rule errors. So there's no errors here right now. Um, if we had had an error, we'd have to deal with it. Sometimes there, you get errors that are silly little things like, oops, like let me do this, okay? And then I'll, let me try to do check DRC. Oh, I guess it doesn't care about that. Well, interesting. Okay, well, it's not giving us any design rule errors. Uh, it, it would be, well, here, let's, let's make one happen. Okay. So we just did that and we'll do design and it's still saying no DRC. That's, oh, cause that's allowed to be connected. Let's do that. Okay. So if I had done that, if I connected the ground to L1 and I do design, check DRC, well, it gives us a bunch of errors. It says, no, oh, you can't do that. You got to keep those two, those pads are two different signals. You got to keep them far away. So we have to go back and put this thing back to close to where it was. I don't remember where it was exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, so now design, check DRC. Okay. No errors. Looking okay. Okay. So I'm going to do a couple things. One, I'm going to change the size of this outer box because that my, I gave myself a lot of space to work. I didn't need it all. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. So this will define the outside cutout of our PCB. Okay. And so now this is a fun thing that I haven't shown you yet. So first of all, let's save. God, let's save. Let's do 3D view. Boom, look at this. So, oh, look at that. So I generated a, now I can, uh, so left click rotates it around, right click pans, scroll wheel zooms in and out. Uh, so look at that. So we have a view of the circuit board. You see these little holes that goes through to the ground connection. If we rotate it around, we can see all those little holes through to the ground plane are on the bottom there. That's great. Um, and everything looks okay. What I really like with 3D view is to check this heading, to check these headers and make sure they all look okay. Um, yeah, everything looks pretty good to me. But there's some other stuff, right? Is if you go back and look at the spark phone, right? They have nice little letters that show you what the stuff is. So they put the letters on the top. It doesn't really matter where the letters are as long as it's specified. So we'll put the letters on the back. So what I want to do is I'm going to close the 3D view, go back to the board. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, view
Interesting. I thought you could flip the, the board. You know, I think actually they automatically flip the board when you do the bottom side is what's happening. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to place text on the bottom of the board that tells us what all these pins are. Um, so in this case, yeah, interesting. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, so there's top layer, bottom layer. Those are the two layers of copper. There's top silk screen. That's what all this stuff is. This is an actual, these are going to be images that are printed on top of the circuit board. Then there's also bottom silk layer. So the bottom silk layer here, if we go here, we can place text on the bottom silk layer. We can place text on the bottom silk layer and it'll allow us to just let ourselves remember which pin is which. So. So this one was L10. What did they call that on SparkFun? They called that, well, they called it red. Let's just say V plus. We'll call it V plus. So if we go and we go place text. So I guess it, it is showing it backwards. I got to switch this. Hit escape. So you. Figure, let me let me pause this and figure out how to flip the board. Okay, I found out what it is. You can only flip the board if uh, if you pay for the premium version. So that's lovely. So we just have to work with text that's backwards. So we just have to know it's going to be on the back side of the board. So this this one we're going to change it to V plus. So this is going to be the the top side of the bridge. Uh, and then the next one, so let's do, so the next one down was R1, shift to that pin. What was that called? That was called B plus. We'll just call it B plus. Place text. Plus, plus one, B minus, okay. And then over here, also we'll place this text on the back. Um, so this one's gonna be our VCC data clock round. Now these look like they're a little, it's a little too crunched when we put four on there. So one thing we can do is we can change the height. Let's just change it to 1.8. Okay, so then this one is going to be VCC, which is our power. This one's going to be our data. And I want to double check that. And then this one is going to be our clock. Well, actually, let's check it now. So it was. Yeah, data and then clock. And then this one is ground. A little crowded. We probably could have shrunk this font even more. This is up to you, right? So making this pretty, I don't spend a lot of time making it pretty and that's, it should be fine. Okay, um, so let's view this again. Let's, let's view it and make sure it looks okay. 
Yeah, so in the back, VC, so we can see which pin is which. VCC, data, clock, ground, B plus, B plus, B minus. Lovely. Um, okay, and on the top, it looks like that. So there's a couple extra things we want to do, though. So let's switch to top silk, and let's put our name on this thing. And the main reason you want to put your name is so you know it's yours. When these come back from the fab, I need to know whose is whose. Um, but the other thing is, this is something that might be really nice for you to put in like your resume or portfolio to show people, hey, I've gone through the process of creating PCBs. So we're gonna switch to the top layer. I'm gonna put my name on the top layer. Um, and so this will just say, engineer, oops. I'll just copy paste it. Eh, it's getting a little close. Now, well, designer is apparently the same length of word as engineer. Lee John. Some of you have crazy long names. So if you have crazy long names, you might want to get fancy with the size of the font and everything, right? Again, you can just click it, change the height, change the line width, do whatever you want to, to you know, make it look. You can change the font family if you want, I guess. But you can fiddle with that to make it look good. Um, move this over a little bit, maybe. That looks fine. So we can go back to view 3D. Okay, yeah, there's John Lund. Look at that. So if I if I put this in my resume, if I put if I put this in my portfolio, oh look at that, I made a PCB. Uh, let's do let's make it even more fancy though. Let's add some graphics to it. Let's make this thing look kind of good. So one thing you can do is let's switch back to the bottom silk layer and let's add an image. So just place image. Now what I like about this software is it actually makes this process very easy. This is very difficult in some software tools. So if I go to pictures, I pre-created a little image here of <laughs> a little strain gauge that's uh, the Viking horns. So the main thing is you, the overall size. It's very easy to uh, end up making these things way too big to the point they don't fit on your PCB. So if I make this height of this thing, maybe 25 millimeters. Um, hopefully that's, eh, let's make it 20. And I think everything's okay. I might have to invert the shape. I, I don't, I think it automatically inverts it. Yeah, it automatically inverted it to be on the bottom. Okay, so now, uh, is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. That's barely okay, right? But you see, even that's pretty big. So this is only 20 millimeters high. This is not a very big board. Place that on there. Hit escape now. 3D view. All right, look at this. Now that's lovely, right? That is lovely. That is an attention to detail that... Um, really, really makes it pop. And that was 10 minutes in Microsoft Paint to do that. So, okay, so now, as far as I'm concerned, this board is done. That's as done as I wanna make it. What's other stuff we could have done? We could have added mounting holes. To do that, the best thing is to go back into the schematic and create a part that's a mounting hole that's uh, defined for the so hole sizes. I don't wanna make this too complicated, though. Everything looks good. I feel like if I had this in my hand, I could assemble it. Uh, it looks, it's pretty enough that I could show it off Show it to my family, show it to a potential employer. Now the question is, how do we export this thing? So once we think we're done, once again, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna close these 3D views, but I'm gonna go back just to be sure once again, and I'm gonna do check DRC. No errors, okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go file, export, um, oops, generate PCB fabrication files right here. So I'm gonna do this. Save, yeah, save, I should have saved. Okay, so file, 
Generate PCB fabrication files. Okay, so that's all good. Okay. So this thing is going to get now the, the color you choose doesn't really matter but the problem is it's going to want to do this it's trying to get you to buy it from them we will buy it from them eventually but not right now so the pcb quantity stuff doesn't really matter um, the color doesn't really matter the main thing is just to click this generate gerbers and this asks us where we want to put our gerber so i'll just put it in the documents folder right here so i will put this so and i will call this now, what we should have done, actually, I'm going to cancel it. I'm going to cancel it. And I'm going to go file, generate PCB fabrication file Gerbers. Yeah, that's fine. So I'm going to look at this dimension. So it's 33 millimeters by 21.57. I'm going to round that to 33 millimeters by 22 millimeters. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do generate Gerbers. And I'm going to say Lund. Ah, I forget what it was. Ah, let's see, this is bad. This, that is weak memory, is what that is. Generate PCB fabrication files. Okay, 33 by 22. Now we choose what color you want. So we will use a fab that will let you pick the color. Your choices are yellow, black, white, blue, green, red. Um, I recommend students go green, blue, or red. Yellows can yellows and whites and blacks can be an issue. The black ones can be nice. Black's probably okay. Uh, you can do white too, but yellow is the tough one. Nobody likes yellow. It looks really ugly. It takes a long time to make. So just try not to do yellow. But you can specify red, green, blue, white, or black for your PCB. So I'll, this is a Western logo, so I'll just do blue. And then I'll say how many copies I want. You can ask for five or ten copies. I'm just going to ask for five. And then we go and I'll save this to documents and then we'll go save. And that creates a zip file with all the files that we need. And so if we go to documents, that just created uh, oops, I think it's gotta be dot zip. Okay. So that created a zip file. And what you see here is these are drills. These tell the fab where to drill holes. This is the outline, the keep out layer. This is the bottom copper layer. This is the bottom overlay. That's that silk screen. This is the bottom solder mask. That defines where there should be gaps uh, to allow solder to connect to the metal pads and where there shouldn't be gaps. The top is the top. This is the top copper. This is the top paste, which is used for making a stencil if you want to do a stencil. This is the top overlay, that top silk screen, all the text and stuff. Uh, and this is the top solder mask. And then there's this how to order because they're just trying to sell it to you. But what we're going to do is we're going to check it. Uh, we're going to check our design, make sure everything looks okay and passes inspection using Osh Park. I'm logged in. It's free to create an account. But what we're going to do is we're just going to take our file, drag it over here, and double check everything through the Osh Park software just to make sure everything looks okay, make sure everything seems to be connected okay. It looks like what I want. It all looks correct. V plus, B minus, B plus, B minus, VCC, data clock, ground. I probably should have changed the font size. I probably could have spent a little more time on that. But this is a finished PCB. So, and this says 33 by 22, and they estimated it was 33.1 by 21.7. So they estimated a little bit bigger than what was shown in our software. That should be fine. Um, they said they merged some stuff. Uh, file, yeah, now how to order PCB.txt, yeah, yeah, so that's, that's that extra little text file they threw in, it's fine, it doesn't hurt anything. Because uh, again, the people who make the software are trying to sell it to you. So this is ready for fab, so right now, let's say you wanted to buy, let's say you had done all this work and you said, I don't want John to pay for it, I want to pay for it myself. All you would do is you would go continue, board top, board bottom, drills, top layer, bottom, you check, you can check each layer if you want, which is kind of cool. Click order. So $2.50 is what this would cost. $2.50, let's just order it now. Heck. Uh, oh no, 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 no. This is, I had stuff in my cart. <laughs> Our board, which is here, is $5.55. Okay, so five bucks, whatever. Um, test board too, I don't know what the heck this is. Sorry, I had, junk in my box. Okay, so this is the order I had. I don't want to pay for Swift or anything like that. 
I just do checkout. See, why do they do this stuff? You're ordering your awesome product. I hate that stuff. Like, I'm not a child. You don't have to keep telling me I'm wonderful. I know I'm wonderful. Yeah, so all this stuff. You can enter your name, phone number, do shipping, postal code, accept corrections. That's, that's my home address. Please don't go to my house, okay? That's my home. Don't go to my house. Free shipping. Look at that. Free shipping USPS. Complete order. Boom. Your order has been received, but it's not yet. Oh, shoot. It wants me to pay. Uh, I don't think that's a valid card. Well, I'll go back and pay offline. If you're here at this stage of the design, you're done, you finished the project, what you're going to do is you're going to upload the zip folder you just created. You're going to upload that to, uh, you're going to upload that to, um, boy, I am just, my mind is not here today. Uh, Canvas. You're going to upload that to Canvas. You're going to submit that as the PCB assignment and then you're done. So it should have your name somewhere. The rules are the file format has to be what we specified. Millimeters, uh, the color you want, the number, do you want five or ten? Um, and then your name has to be somewhere on the PCB itself that has to be visible. Make sure it's visible in the verification. And then, and then you're good to go. So you're done. You've created a PCB. It was that simple. There are more advanced things like routing on multiple layers. We can talk about that if people want. I mainly just wanted to show people it's not that tough. It's not that tough to go from a schematic design, build the schematic, build the PCB, wire it up, submit it out to fab. It's very easy. It's very straightforward. And now that you're here, you've done it. All right. Thank you, everybody.